Good afternoon, everyone. This is Wendy Nelson from the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research here at the National Institute of Health. Welcome. This is going to be a really exciting and informative webinar, and I know you're really going to enjoy it. I'm going to spend a second introducing our speaker, but I know you don't want to hear me. You want to hear her. So I'm going to introduce Laura Rogers, um, and she is a professor in the Department of Nutrition Sciences at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And as she's going to tell you, she has done absolutely amazing work um, in diet and activity with women with breast cancer. And um, like I said, you don't want to hear me. You want to hear, you want to definitely want to hear Dr. Rogers. So with that, I'm going to give it to her. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for that nice introduction. It is an honor and pleasure to be here today, Wendy. Uh, during this presentation, I will be discussing the importance of physical activity adherence after a breast cancer diagnosis. I want to review the excellent progress that's been made in the field as it relates to designing and testing interventions to improve uh, physical activity adherence in breast cancer patients, and then also discuss uh, future directions with a special emphasis on concomitant chronic disease conditions. First, with regard to the importance of physical activity adherence after a breast cancer a diagnosis, this is one example of several studies that have looked at the association between exercise post-breast cancer diagnosis and breast cancer risk. In this particular study, it was a meta-analysis of, of six studies, and for the purposes of application, I have converted the original units of met hours per week to the number of hours of moderate intensity walking per week. In, in this meta-analysis, it revealed that for breast cancer survivors who were doing one to three hours per week of activity equivalent to moderate intensity walking, that a 20% reduction in their risk of breast cancer recurrence with those uh, engaging in three or more hours a week having a reduction in risk of of uh, 35%. A similar pattern is seen with regard to breast cancer mortality risk uh, with uh, those women engaging in one to three hours per week of activity demonstrating a, a significant reduction in risk of breast cancer mortality with an even greater reduction uh, of 46% for those doing at least three hours per week of the activity. So it's important that breast cancer survivors engage in regular physical activity after their uh, breast cancer diagnosis. There are several studies that have demonstrated that the majority of breast cancer survivors are not meeting current recommendations, which are generally at this point recommended to be at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise uh, or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity exercise. This is one uh, example of a study that has looked at the prevalence of meeting recommendations among breast cancer survivors. This was a multi-ethnic sample from three U.S. states, and it revealed that only 34% of the breast cancer survivors were meeting uh, exercise recommendations pre-diagnosis. Only 34% were meeting these recommendations at 24 months post-diagnosis. 40% were meeting it at five years, and only 21% were meeting uh, these recommendations at 10 years post-diagnosis. Uh, given the importance of physical activity after a cancer diagnosis, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network has added exercise or included exercise recommendations to their recently released survivorship guidelines. These survivorship guidelines are not uh, breast cancer specific. They are appropriate for all cancer types. But the important thing is that the NCCN is considered a, a go-to uh, resource for many oncology healthcare professional, professionals for uh, determining uh, appropriate clinical algorithms. And in the recent survivorship guidelines, it is recommended that uh, the oncology health professional assess the current physical, physical activity level and limitations of physical activity among their cancer survivors encourage physical activity as soon as possible after the diagnosis, tailor recommendations to abilities and preferences, and then it provides general recommendations of 
encouraging the, the cancer survivor to engage in at least 150 weekly minutes of moderate intensity or 75 weekly minutes of vigorous intensity physical activity with strength training two to three days a week and stretching on days other exercises are performed. The important thing about these guidelines is it w continues to raise awareness among oncology healthcare professionals about the importance of physical activity uh, adherence after a cancer diagnosis. Uh, and I think this is an opportunity uh, for a future direction as far as integrating uh, interventions into the clinical care infrastructure. Now, as part of those guidelines, uh, strength training is mentioned uh, and it's uh, recommended two to three times per week. Uh, this is a study that, has looked, that looked at the prevalence of doing any strength training among breast cancer survivors. This took place in Australia. Uh, we don't have as much information about the prevalence of this particular uh, activity, the resistance training. But in uh, this particular sample, the adherence to strength doing any strength training at all was half that of engaging in aerobic activity. So this is uh, the point of this slide is to demonstrate that, um, that focusing on resistance training adherence is an important uh, aspect that uh, we have with that we need to deal with in the future. As part, part of the NCCN survivorship guidelines, there is a risk stratification recommended to help the healthcare professional um, provide the required or the appropriate recommendations. And they divide individuals into low risk, moderate risk, high risk, or other. Uh, the low risk are those individuals with early stage cancer, high baseline physical activity, and no significant comorbidities. And it's recommended that these individuals be given the general recommendations. For those individuals in the moderate risk, these are individuals uh, that have peripheral neuropathy, musculoskeletal issues, bone mets, or poor bone health. And the, the recommendation here is to recommend general recommendations, but also consider whether a medical evaluation or referral to a trained exercise personnel is needed. High risk is defined as individuals with lung or major abdominal surgery, ostomy, cardiopulmonary comorbidities, lymphedema, or extreme fatigue. And it's recommended these individuals get, have medical clearance and consider referral to a trained exercise personnel. There are individuals who uh, it is recommended that they avoid physical activity. These are individuals with severe anemia, uh, individuals who are immediately post-surgery, uh, who have worsening of their physical condition or the acute infection. Uh, these, this risk stratification is not specific to breast. It, it is appropriate for all cancer types. Important thing of, uh, about this risk stratification is that it includes, you know, comorbidities are part of the definition for the various risk strata. And so that's part of the reason why there's a special emphasis on concomitant chronic disease states in this presentation. So I want to talk a minute about uh, one way to look at the cancer, chronic disease, and physical activity interface. One of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this was that the, uh, the uh, adherence network is a trans NIH initiative and is not, you know, it's focused on just one particular disease state. So as I see it, uh, chronic disease and cancer often share risk factors, and I'll show you an example of that. In addition, cancer can either exacerbate or cause a chronic disease. Uh, in addition to that, you have physical activity adherence, which could improve a chronic disease or perhaps reduce the risk of a cancer. And then there's also the, the fact that the chronic disease and possibly cancer can impact physical activity adherence. Lay on that the, the teachable moment of a cancer diagnosis, and you have an opportunity to potentially uh, intervene not only on their cancer risk, but on their concomitant chronic disease conditions as well. This is a study, uh, a U.S. national study looking at the prevalence of chronic disease conditions among long-term cancer survivors versus those without a cancer history. Uh, as you can see, there was a higher prevalence in the long-term cancer survivors of arthritis, asthma, coronary heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, and stroke. Uh, some of this, in, this higher prevalence could indeed be related to age, as you can see that a much higher number of long-term cancer survivors were 65 years of age or older. The, the rate prevalence of smoking was equivalent in the, in the two groups, and uh, that 
the prevalence of 19% is a number I'll mention again a little bit later. So this is an example of how there can be uh, shared risk factors. If you look at chronic disease, uh, a shared risk factor as far as chronic disease and cancer, especially with regard to cardiovascular disease, uh, some of the shared risk factors include age, poor physical activity and diet, uh, excess body weight, metabolic dysregulation, inflammation, and possibly hormonal deprivation. It's also possible uh, that cancer treatment can cause a chronic disease, as demonstrated by this example, uh, which is the cardiac to toxicity or the increased cardiovascular disease risk that may result from anthracyclines, HER2 antibodies, um, directed monoclonal antibodies, or endocrine therapy. In addition, this is an example of uh, cancer, how cancer treatment might exacerbate a chronic disease. In this case, it is because of a decreased ability to do self-management for diabetes. In this study, they asked uh, diabetic patients to complete a self-care inventory. And uh, at baseline, before chemotherapy, the score was 51, and it, it significantly dropped to a score of 46 at uh, eight weeks. So those are just a few examples that fit within this paradigm of the interface between cancer, chronic disease, and physical activity. And as we talk about physical activity, behavior change, and breast cancer uh, survivors, um, I'll be talking some about this chronic concomitant chronic disease. And Dr. Kernier has described three different types of exercise trials. Uh, behavior change trials are those trials in which the primary outcome is exercise behavior. Ex efficacy trials are those in which uh, the primary outcome is a health outcome. And ef effectiveness trial is the primary outcome is a health outcome, but uh, these usually involve behavior change as part of those trials. For the, uh, for the purposes of uh, focus during this presentation, I'm going to focus on the behavior change trials uh, only. A couple of caveats when it comes to doing that is that the distinction between exercise behavior change efficacy and effectiveness trials may not always be clear. And in the interest of time, I chose to focus only on studies that were done in adults, breast cancer specifically, that were randomized controlled trials and that uh, were testing physical activity adherence or behavior change studies. They were not weight loss trials. I found 11 of these trials. I'm going to spend a minute on this slide. Uh, it'll make it a little bit easier to follow the rest of the, the slides that follow. This first study, uh, and I put these in the order uh, from uh, the order in which they were published. So this first study was published in 2004 by Lee Jones, and it compared uh, the effects of having a physician deliver a standard recommendation in clinic versus having the physician deliver the same rec uh, recommendation plus a referral to an exercise professional versus usual care. And in that uh, intervention, they did demonstrate a significant improvement in the short-term um, physical activity adherence for those who received the physician recommendation, recommendation only. Second trial is a move forward trial by uh, Dr. Pinto. This is a 12-week trial that included a pedometer, print material, one in-person visit, telephone counseling, and feedback. Uh, and in this study, uh, she was able to demonstrate a significant improvement in uh, short-term physical activity adherence by self-report, uh, but not by accelerometer. The third trial was a six-month trial that involved uh, 21 lifestyle group sessions uh, unfortunately, this study was not able to demonstrate a significant improvement in physical activity adherence uh, by uh, self-report, uh, but they did see an improvement in some of their physical functioning measures. Uh, the next, this uh, fourth study was a 12-week study in which they used pedometer print, one in-person visit, and telephone counseling, and they were able to demonstrate significant improvements in physical activity adherence, both by self-report and accelerometer. This study by uh, Dr. Valance was a 12-week study in which he compared a standard recommendation versus targeted print material 
versus a pedometer with the calendar, step calendar versus a print plus a pedometer. This is a particularly inter interesting trial, and I'll be giving you some additional details on the results of that in a few minutes. But this study demonstrated a significant improvement in the self-report physical activity, but, the but was not able to, to demonstrate that the increase in pedometer steps was significant. So see that this uh, next intervention included three six-hour workshops that occurred over a three-month period. Uh, some individual feedback was provided between the second and third workshop, and they demonstrated significant improvements in physical activity post-intervention. This is a study done on, out of our lab. This was a pilot study, and it's a three-month intervention in which individuals receive both individual and group sessions, as well as print materials. The individual sessions uh, are initially supervised exercise sessions with exercise specialists, and eventually they are uh, transitioned to home-based exercise and uh, just come in for individual face-to-face -face counseling sessions. They also come to group sessions six times to discuss behavioral modification uh, techniques. We were able to demonstrate a significant improvement in a physical activity post-intervention based on the accelerometer. This is a the next study that was out of Korea. Uh, they used telephone counseling uh, over 12 weeks, delivered by nurses tailored to stage of change. They also had a workbook, uh, although the, the, uh, they did not see a significant improvement in self-report physical activity adherence, the p-value was 0 0.08. In B plus resistance, that was uh, out of our lab, we, we used the original B cancer pilot intervention, but we also added to that resistance bands, which is important because uh, none of the, uh, of the, of these 11 studies, none have reported the resistance exercise adherence, nor have they focused on resistance training. So uh, I'm going to show you our data related to that and, and just, um, you know, in the future directions, I think we need to look further at resistance training. Recently, a group has done a 12-week intervention with uh, emails and access to an e-counselor, and this group was able to demonstrate a significant improvement in physical activity based on self-report. And then lastly, Dr. Pinto's group uh, combined physician advice with a pedometer and telephone counseling and demonstrated significant improvements in post-intervention physical activity based on self-report. Uh, the, there are a couple of take-home messages from this slide. Uh, number one, of these 11, nine have been uh, home-based with only two combining the supervised with the home-based uh, options. They have used a variety of components that are varied, varied from physician recommendation to pedometer to telephone counseling workshops, print materials, emails, so there's a, quite a variety here of things that have been tried. For the most part, the short-term or immediate post-intervention adherence has been good, and we have very little uh, focus on resistance training up, in, up to this point. This is Dr. Valence's trial in which he compared the standard recommendation uh, with print material. Uh, with pedometer plus step cal calendar, with the print material plus pedometer and step calendar. Um, the, just to review the slide for those who may not be looking at a screen at this point, um, the print materials, although the mean increase from baseline to post-intervention and self-reported minutes of physical activity uh, was 70 compared to 30 for the standard recommendation, the difference between these groups was not significant. Um, the mean increase in minutes of physical activity for the pedometer plus step calendar was 89, which was significantly different from the standard recommendation group. And the print material plus the pedometer mean inc increase was 87, and it was also significantly different from the standard recommendation. And uh, the take-home message from this slide is that uh, the pedometer is, I think, a very effective tool that we need to continue to to integrate into our interventions going forward. And the B plus uh, resistance uh, intervention in which we uh, gave individuals uh, resistance bands and supervised their uh, training, um, 
initially and then sent them home to do the training at home, what we found is that the, per the percent of recommended sessions completed during the entire 12-week intervention overall was 87.5, but if we look just at the last four weeks, which was the home-based version, it was only 63%. And the average number of sessions per week during the 12-week intervention was 1.8, and during the last four weeks it was only 1.3. If you compare these same 11 studies with regard to whether they measured longer-term adherence, uh, we see that uh, um, about uh, half of them didn't, were, did not measure longer-term adherence, and of those who did, we do have uh, two studies that have demonstrated significant uh, improvements in physical activity longer-term and not just post-intervention, with, with, with one of those demonstrating this, these improvements by accelerometer. I thought it was interesting the, to compare these with regard to the integrated the intervention into clinical care, primarily because of the, the rising interest among the oncology field for exercise after a cancer diagnosis. And we do have three possibilities here. Uh, the, uh, the initial study by Jones related to the physician recommendation, the group in Korea who, who had the nurses doing the telephone counseling, and then uh, Dr. Pinto's work. As far as minority or underserved populations, there are very few, as you can see out there. The, the, there is one that had about 50% minority, and um, about a third of Dr. Valence's sample was rural. Uh, but otherwise, there's very limited e evidence regarding randomized controlled trials for physical activity behavior change in breast cancer survivors from minority or underserved populations. This is uh, the data from our study in which we demonstrated the longer-term adherence based on the accelerometer. What we found is that immediately post-intervention there was a significant improvement in minutes of at least moderate intensity activity per week by the accelerometer, which was maintained three months uh, later. This is the data from uh, Dr. Jones's study in which he compared the, in the usual care with physician recommendation only versus physician recommendation plus referral. And uh, what they found was that the physician recommendation only was, uh, resulted in a significant improvement in the physical activity, whereas uh, when you added the, physical, the, the recommendation to the referral, they did not get the same benefits. It, it, from the standpoint of the NCCN guidelines and making recommendations for referrals to patients, uh, it's, it would be interesting to know if there's a way to reframe a referral or frame referral so that, that uh, you know, it's possible that patients who were given a referral thought they couldn't exercise unless they had the referral or they could have used it as an excuse or uh, in, in, in this particular study by Dr. Jones, they weren't referred for any specific comorbidity. They were just randomly referred. So uh, it might be interesting to pay attention to the framing of the message regarding referral. This is an, the other, another study with uh, demonstrating the integration within clinical care, and this is a study in which Dr. Pinto uh, combined uh, telephone counseling with a physician recommendation. Uh, she reported the odds ratio for meeting physical activity recommendations uh, for the uh, you know, intervention group compared to the control group, and the odds ratio was significant um, at three months and six months, uh, but uh, not at 12 months. If you look at these, uh, these 11 trials and compare them as to treatment status, what have they reported adverse events, and whether they excluded individuals based on a medical comorbidity, we see that all of these 11 were done post-primary treatment. Only two have reported adverse event uh, details, or at least any information about adverse event. And um, all of them, all except one specified medical comorbidity exclusion. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you shouldn't exclude, because it's primarily for safety reasons. Uh, most of the studies required to use the patient have a medical clearance or, or, or they would say they couldn't have a significant comorbidity or they had to be able to ambulate or, or uh, other uh, 
general terms. Some of them would actually exclude based on a specific comorbidity. I think this is important for safety purposes, but may reduce the generalizability of these results to some of the higher risk strata uh, in the NCCN guidelines. Um, any of the studies that, that mentioned or described the comorbidity, uh, comorbidities within their sample usually would provide only a mean number of comorbidities for the sample. Dr. Valence in his uh, study did report the specific prevalence of hypertension and diabetes. So I pulled the uh, prevalence of these uh, conditions from uh, two population-based studies in mixed cancer types to, to compare the prevalence that was in Dr. Valence's study with those, just to get an idea about how generalizable uh, the breast cancer, the behavior change studies in breast cancer survivors might be to individuals with multiple co comorbidities. And although the prevalence of overweight or obese was similar to this population-based study, the, the uh, prevalence of hypertension and diabetes was lower. If you look at the FISCOT2 behavior change uh, trials from the standpoint of whether they measured uh, a medical comorbidity-related outcome as a secondary outcome, obviously these are behavior change studies, so the primary outcome is changing behavior. Uh, but uh, looking at medical, I, I looked to see if they had measured uh, secondary outcomes, and several of them had primarily body composition-related outcomes. We've measured, measured joint dysfunction and inflammation in our studies as well. It appears that the, the changes in body weight and composition in these behavior change studies have been minimal to, to not minimal, or if it's uh, small, it's not significant. Uh, possible reasons for this may be the study durations, also the physical activity amount and intensity may not be sufficient to see these significant changes. This is some pilot work that we did with the BEAT plus resistance study in which we did see a decline in the IL-6 to IL-10 or pro to anti-inflammatory ratio for the intervention group uh, compared to the control group. This was not statistically significant. Um, we were not powered to see that difference, but the pattern suggests that it, it may be possible for physical activity behavior change interventions to address some of the shared risk factors between uh, cancer and concomitant uh, chronic disease conditions. In our beat cancer pilot study, we also me measured lower extremity uh, joint dysfunction with the WOMAC, and in this, uh, in this study we saw the, um, maintenance of, uh, of function in the uh, intervention group with the control group having a significant um, increase in the dysfunction suggesting that it is possible for these uh, behavior change interventions to manage concomitant chronic disease. So I pulled the uh, nine that showed significant increases in physical activity short term and uh, looked at the, and have listed on this slide the theory that was used uh, for development of that intervention. And I've underlined the interventions that demonstrated um, or at least showed promise for a longer term increase in physical activity. And you can see that the three major theories used are trans theoretical model, social cognitive theory, and the theory of planned behavior. And uh, I think that those are reasonable theories, and going forward, those seems like theories to continue to use as we develop and refine the inter interventions. We do have five studies that have reported mediators or predictors of the intervention effects. And uh, these, uh, these uh, mediators or predictors have included perce perceived behavioral control, planning and intention, which are part of the theory of planned behavior, also self-efficacy, reduced barriers, interference, and social support uh, are showing promise in it as well. Because we demonstrated significant uh, mediation of our intervention uh, effects, uh, we saw significant mediation by um, perceived barriers interference. So I wanted to show this slide, which is on published data that we have from 
uh, over 400 rural breast cancer survivors, and this is the, the percent who were reporting uh, these barriers to physical activity. Uh, as you can see, there are some of these barriers that may overlap with uh, concomitant chronic conditions such as fatigue, pain, uh, and fear of injury. I want to mention briefly about dissemination and implementation uh, because it's, it's important that we uh, take what we know about physical activity behavior change and, and, and try to disseminate it to as large a population as we can. We have very few trials in this area. This is a, a dissemination and implementation trial of the moving forward intervention that was developed by Dr. Pinto. This was not a randomized controlled trial, but I wanted to point it out because that's an excellent example of this kind of work that needs to be done. She did train lay volunteers to, to deliver the telephone counseling and saw significant improvement in the self-reported weekly minutes of physical activity at 12 weeks with some tapering off at 24 weeks. None of the studies have done a cost-effectiveness analysis. It's very important that uh, this be done uh, in the future. This is a this is a this is a comparison of just you know my my assessment of the relative cost of these various uh, these various interventions and then whether the intervention resulted in the short term increase or the longer term increase in physical activity. Um, fortunately, the the most expensive one did t tend at least in the pilot in the pilot study to show some promise. I think what we really need to know is who needs who needs the more intensive interventions and who doesn't so that we can allocate our resources in addition to obviously doing cost effectiveness analysis. I'm sure there are more than, there are many ongoing trials out there that, or there may be some that I'm unaware of. I did find these design papers uh, when I did the literature review. Uh, the first one is uh, the study where we're, we're taking our beet cancer uh, intervention and testing it in, in three sites. We're enrolling over 200 breast cancer survivors. Uh, I think the noteworthy relevant aspect or the noteworthy aspect relevant to this topic th this afternoon is that we hopefully will be able to um, uh, analyze mediators and moderators of the intervention effect. We are collecting additional detail related to adverse events and we'll be able to look at study site differences. There's a Move More for Life study that is being done in Australia, uh, and it's comparing tailored print versus targeted print versus standard recommendation. And they, uh, in their materials, include some motivation for resistance training. So it'll be interesting to see what they find. Uh, then there's a group in Spain who's using telemedicine uh, as a way to um, encourage physical activity. So I thought that was uh, noteworthy as well. So in summary, physical activity after a breast cancer uh, diagnosis can reduce breast cancer risk, can manage coexistent chronic medical conditions, can improve shared risk factors, can be potentially motivated by the teachable moment of a cancer diagnosis. We have several effective strategies. Uh, Currently, we certainly have, uh, we certainly can improve in this area, but we do have some effective strategies right now, and they include uh, physician recommendation, telephone counseling, the pedometer with a step calendar, uh, the in-person approach combining individual with group support, and, our e and the email with access to the e-counselor. I think some future directions related to optimizing the teachable moment. I uh, first, with regard to considering the coexistent chronic diseases, uh, it would, I think what we uh, one direction is considering interventions for breast cancer survivors with significant comorbidities who might not necessarily uh, meet the inclusion criteria for some of these other studies that have been done. Uh, I think we need to improve reporting of our adverse events so that we can design uh, interventions for uh, going forward for individuals who may um, develop these events uh, during an intervention. And so if we can develop ways to help them deal with that, we can improve their activity level as well. And we need to consider as secondary outcomes, comorbidity-related outcomes. 
I think we need to expand availability through dissemination and implementation application and research. We need additional cost effectiveness analysis. We need to think about how we can integrate the interventions into the clinical care infrastructure and uh, continue to work on interventions for minority and underserved breast cancer populations. As far as improving behavior change interventions for breast cancer survivors, uh, 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 some areas include uh, further mediator and moderator analysis so we can determine the active agents within the intervention so that we can uh, uh, maximize the use of those uh, in future interventions. We need to be examining the moderator analysis to determine who is going to respond to an intervention and who isn't. And, um, how can we uh, tailor future interventions to these individuals? We also need to focus on longer-term adherence and how we can achieve that, as well as how can we achieve adherence to resistance training recommendations. Uh, it's also apparent that we need some during breast cancer treatment behavior change trials, and there's always a, a role for continuing to consider how technology fits uh, within our behavior change uh, efforts. And thank you. With that, I will wrap it up and take questions. So please, you have an option for questions here. You can reach us on Twitter at hashtag NIHAdherence. You can also email me, Wendy Nelson, at M-I-L-S-E-N-W-J at od.nih.gov. It is on the left side of your screen, all of those connections. So let's hear your questions. I, I have a question. I'll start with me because I'm here. Um, how early do you think in treatment you can start activity? I think you can start immediately. You might have to do light activity, a very short duration that's spread out during the day or spread out during the week. But you can start immediately just moving around as much as you can. Great. And do you think, I mean, is this a testable? Can we test when we could do it and how much? And It is testable. And there are individuals who are doing exercise efficacy studies in the, in the during treatment time period, and they're finding it safe to do, you know, supervised, um, you know, prescribing a specific amount of exercise at a specific intensity and having them come in and exercise, and they're finding that those are set, that that's safe. So. Okay. Great. And we have a question from one of our listeners, and it is, how did Spain use telemedicine as an intervention? We're moving back through the slides. They, they use video conferencing uh, uh, as a way to deliver some of the counseling. And I would have to look up, I can't remember if they were doing the personalized training sessions over it as well. I think they may have been trying to do some of that over the telemedicine as well. If that person will let me know, I'll send them the citation. Okay, we will, um, for that for that person's questions, we will send around the citation. So. Other questions? Do we have any on coming in on Twitter? They're all a very quiet bunch today. We have a question in the room. With an eye towards uh, dissemination and evidence showing um, benefit of exercise at less than um, physical activity guidelines, is there a uh, kind of minimum level that you think would be um, maybe not desirable, but kind of where, where should the bar set in terms of what the clinical potency should be for an intervention? I usually recommend at least an hour a week, and that's based on, uh, Wendy, can I go backwards? Sure. All the way. Oh. I usually base that on this, that they should get at least an hour a week. 
And I use this to tell to tell patients that, you know, you don't have to run a half marathon, you know. And if all you can do is an hour a week, you know, do an hour a week. Don't let it discourage you or keep you from doing it if you if you can't do, you know, 150 minutes a week. And we're looking at the slide for the post-diagnosis exercise in breast cancer mortality, which you're saying something is better than nothing. Yes. Uh -huh. okay. Other questions? I'm not seeing anything on Twitter. Oh, sorry, we got another question here. Um, in what ways might electronic clinician-supported electronic tools support positive mediating or moderating factors. Boy, you got a lot of clauses in that one. I think they're wondering what I, I, what about electronic technology with support from clinicians might help. How do you think that might affect what you're what you're what you're talking about here? Uh, well, con with more and more practice plans putting in place what they call a portal where patients can have e email directly with their patients with their doctors and they can also do some things directly online with their EHR. I think that's going to be a natural, natural evolving next step that, that would allow clinicians to interact with their patients through that, that portal. I was intrigued by that intervention that used the access to the e-counselor through email. Um, I'm not, it could potentially be a physician as the e-counselor, but it also could be a, you know, an, an you know, an exercise trainer, or it could be a nurse, or um, it, it could be someone else on the healthcare team with the physician just as a backup. Mm -hmm. I think that leads perfectly into our next question. Could you talk a little about the advantages and disadvantages of integrating physical activity interventions for survivals into clinical care as opposed to having them purely adjunct treatments? Probably the biggest challenge to integrating it into clinical care is that uh, physicians are so busy that uh, it's it, one of the challenges is getting physicians to remember to talk about it with their patients and then giving them the tools to be able to provide them with effective uh, counseling. If you take it uh, then the alternative to that is to say, okay, the physician can have individuals within his office who can counsel with patients as part of that, but then there's the issue of cost and how do you pay for that since at this point, um, unless it's a nurse, which why I was intrigued by the Korea study, a nurse can bill for a nurse visit, but if they meet with a trainer, it's not a billable service. And so um, the challenge is if you put it in the clinical care, you've got to pay for it somehow, and that's a challenge. Um, patients respond well to uh, the – tend to seem to respond well to a physician telling them that they need to do it, but um, how we fully integrate is going to be a challenge, which I think is why cost-effectiveness analysis is going to be really important. Cool, and that kind of leads right into our next question which is what other professionals should we be partnering with here? PT, occupational? I mean, you've talked a lot about physicians, but are there other people you think we should be in medical practice that we should be working with? Uh, well, yes. Uh, that's a great question. There, I mean, this tended to focus a little bit on oncology, but there are also other physicians outside oncology, like primary care physicians, who we, probably, who we would need to partner with. Uh, as far as other individuals within the clinical infrastructure, uh, nurses, we should be working with them. Dietitians, who oftentimes uh, can bill for time, depending on uh, the comorbidity. They can deliver some exercise uh, counseling as well. Um, the, certainly physical therapy is a, a, an, excellent, uh, an excellent suggestion because they can bill as well. Okay, great. And we have a couple of people that are interested in the technology. Um, I guess that's not surprising. Um, there was about what kind of accelerometer was used for the BEAT study, and they asked, was it FDA-approved medical device? Well, it was an actograph. Okay. Which is not an FDA-approved medical device because it's a wellness device, so 
Right. So yeah. an accelerometer does not need to be FDA approved unless it is a oh. drug thing, a medical condition. I didn't condition. that was the question. Okay. Yes. So, but it was was an, right. for that question, it was an act graph. Yes. Okay. And then there's some, some questions about um, any thoughts of the role. I think you talked about this with clinicians but on the role of mHealth in encouraging and extending physical activity, so mobile technology, to um, encourage and extend the effects that you're seeing here, the powerful effects you have here. Can you ask the question one more time? Because it's a great question, and I want to think about my answer. Oh, okay. Um, the, uh, the question is, are, do you have any thought, given all of this really important work you've presented, what about the role of mobile technology, real-time um, measurement and intervention in encouraging and extending physical activity adherence? Yeah, that, uh, I think there are a couple of things we can do. One of the things that Wendy, you and I were talking about a little bit ago was that telephone counseling algorithms could be turned into computer-generated um, you know, programs where people could call and they wouldn't maybe not get a real person, but they would get you know, the computer could interact with them using these uh, algorithms, and it's a well way to potentially take some of um, the telephone counseling and get it out to more people uh, as far as uh, certainly things like lifestyle groups. It, it, you can uh, deliver information uh, over over mobile technology, and now we have a way for people to interact with each other, so there ought to be a way in which we could uh, harness that as well to try to create that group, that group effect. And you already use the actograph, so you're using some of the technology to be able to do real-time measurement. Well, that's an excellent point. Things like this, you know, there are a lot of devices out there for people to wear and that measures how much they're moving and how many calories they're burning and, you know, what they're eating and all that. So uh, somehow connecting that into the feedback to the, to the uh, you know, counseling hub, if you want to call it, would really help. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a switching gears slightly. Can you speculate about the underlying mechanisms that under, underlie the benefits that you've been talking about here of exercise in survivors? The mechanisms? The mechanisms of the benefits, not the mechanisms of the interventions. No. Okay. Of the benefits. So the mechanisms of the benefits may relate to inflammation. There may be hormonal changes that occur. Uh, there's also the connection between, you know, you know, more physical activity may help individuals avoid uh, obesity, uh, which can uh, also reduce their risk. Any particular? All right. Any other questions here? And we've had some really great questions here. I think this was obviously a fabulous presentation, and it's such an important topic. Um, I, I know we all think of physical activity in multiple settings, but to think about it, importance in survivors, that might not be so obvious to, to many of us. So if I'm not seeing any more questions, I think we're going to be able to, I think we'll have an opportunity to end a little early today. So um, from the NIH, I would really like to say thank you to Dr. Rogers. This has been an amazing presentation. I, I know we've all learned so much, and we thank all of you for joining us. Um, it's great having everybody out there on the line for us, uh, you know, with us and learning together. So with that, thanks, everybody, and we'll talk to you on our next webinar.